Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back. So in our uh, last keynote speaker, uh, last but not least, uh, we are really happy and excited to have Dr. Yornina Eldar here with us. Dr. Eldar is a professor in the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science in the Weizmann Institute of Technology in Israel, where, where she heads the Center for Biomedical Engineering and Signal Processing and holds the Dorothy and Patrick Gorman Professional Chair. She's also a visiting professor at the MIT, a visiting scientist at the Broad Institute and, at, and an adjunct professor at Duke University, and has been a visiting professor at Stanford. She is a member of the Israel Academy of Sciences and Humanities, NIEEE Fellow Fellow and a Eurocip Fellow. Uh, she has received her BS degree in physics and BS degree in electrical engineering from Tel Aviv University and a PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT. She has received many awards, including the IEEE Processing Society Technical Achievement Awards and really many, many more awards. Uh, without her, she's also the editor in chief of Foundations and Trends Signal Processing and a member of several IEEE committees. Without further ado, Dr. Elda, it's a great pleasure to have you with us today, and we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So, good afternoon, all the brave people that are here at this time instead of being by the beach. Uh, so it's really, really, really great to be here. And um, last year at ICASP, I think, uh, you know, like you and me were there, right? <laughs> there, were very, uh, there was very, uh, the, the, some, some brave souls. So it's great. I literally just arrived, like, I don't know, an hour ago, but it's great to see so many people. So I'm really looking forward to kind of a lot of interaction. Um, okay. So what I wanted to talk about today is how we could merge or potentially merge model-based ideas that we're used to in signal and image processing with deep learning. And of course, today, you know, deep learning is everywhere. Um, but what I believe before I start going into the details is that, you know, signal processing or model-based, physics-based, you know, everything we're used to actually has a huge role to play. So I know there's a lot of discussion and people saying, oh, AI is taking over everything and, you know, what's the role for signal processing? So actually, I think we have a huge role to play and hopefully uh, I'll convince you of that throughout this talk. So. Like we said, you know, deep deep networks, of course, achieve you know superior performance in many different areas. But if we look carefully, we'll see that actually most of the areas that are very successful are areas that didn't have necessarily very good models before. Okay, so probably you know the two areas where uh, deep learning is the most successful is vision problems, but huge vision problems, right? Where we have huge data sets that we could learn from, and of course, speech. And in both of those applications, uh, there's two things in common. One is that we have huge data sets to learn from, and the other is that we didn't really have very good models before. Okay, so this is very different from some of the problems that we're used to looking at in signal processing. So, of course, we get great success. We could do crazy things, right, like write poems, spawn faces. We could do more useful things, right, like get very good detectors and classifiers, et cetera. But we know that, first of all, we have to get very, very large training sets in order to be successful. The training could be very computationally costly, and this is not practical if we have to keep on training. Okay, now think about it. If we look at, let's say, a network that was trained for a given SNR, very often if the SNR even changes a little bit, then we have to retrain, right? So the computational cost, usually we think of it in deep learning as an offline thing, but actually very often it's online, particularly if we're thinking about communication networks. Of course, it's very hard to get interpretability in general deep networks, and this also relates to the fact that it's not clear how robust the method is, how, how much they generalize, the complexity could be huge, right? If we look at GPT, there's billions of parameters, and of course, this is not practical when we think about signal processing problems. Okay, so this is some of the advantages, but of course, also the disadvantages um, of deep networks. Now, if we look at signal processing, right, which we all know and love, then signal processing, of course, is based on models. That's one of the first things we learn is that we have to start with a model for our problem. The nice thing about a model is that we can incorporate anything we know about the problem. So we can incorporate any domain knowledge. We can incorporate structure, both in the model itself and in the inference model that we want. We know that we could get inference from relatively small amounts of data, so we don't need large data sets to succeed. And also the nice thing is that very often we have techniques that could tell us how well we're doing. In, in retrospect, and even a priori, right? We have bounds that tell us how well we could do even before we uh, come up with a particular estimator. So these are some of the advantages of traditional signal processing. But of course, the disadvantage is that this relies on the fact that we have a very accurate uh, model, which is often not the case. 
And also, even sometimes when we have a model, maybe there's an optimal thing that we could compute, but the computation may not be easy. Okay, so these are kind of the two things we'd like to overcome. And what we, and of course, many, many others in the community have been looking at in recent years, and I want to try and kind of summarize in the short talk, is how we could try and combine the two, how we could try and combine models with uh, recent ideas of deep learning. Okay, so in order to see how we're going to do that before we kind of delve into the math, let's look at kind of a bird's eye view of signal processing and deep learning. And of course, this is kind of very, very generalized. But if we think of a standard signal processing problem, we start with a measurement, okay, we're going to call it Y. We have some desired output X. So for example, this could be a noisy image and this could be a clean image, right? Or this could be, you know, the output of a radar system and this is the target parameters that we want to try and find. And then we have some known relationship between what we measured and, and what we want, okay? So we assume that what we measured Y is approximately some G of X, okay? That's the starting point. We always have a model that we start with. And then once we have a model, we could come up with some metric function. So it could be a norm or it could be some other metric function that we wanna optimize. And then you can use your favorite solver. So, you know, everyone has their own favorite solver. It could be gradient descent, ADMM, projected gradient, whatever, proximal gradient. So you take your favorite solver, you apply it, um, to that model, and typically you'll get something like this. You'll get some pre-processing, some post-processing, and then you'll have these iterations where typically the iterations could be, at least conceptually, you could break them into two parts, a part that depends on the model and a part that's just some generic computation. Okay, so very roughly speaking, this is what a lot of signal processing algorithms end up looking like. Now, on the other hand, when you look at deep learning, or at least supervised deep learning, the setting is very, very different. So what you assume is that you have many paired inputs and outputs. You have a fixed architecture that you decide on on advance, okay? It's not necessarily related to your specific problem. It's some fixed architecture. Maybe it's a UNet or a ResNet or whatever, your favorite uh, network that you want. And then what you're going to learn are these weights. So you take your training data, you learn the weights, and then when a new measurement comes in, you put it into the system and you hope that magically you will get something good. Okay, so this is kind of very roughly speaking how deep learning versus uh, signal processing looks like. So how could we integrate the two? Again, there's many ways of doing this, but roughly speaking, we're going to look at two main techniques. So the first is unfolding or unrolling, which is a really nice idea that dates back to Gregor and McLuhan, and we'll explain it in the next few slides. So in unrolling, you basically use this optimization problem to give you the architecture itself. So you're going to infer using a network where the network resembles the optimization solver. A different technique that we're going to look at is a more data-driven hybrid method, where you actually don't infer using a network, you infer using the algorithm, but anywhere there's something that you don't know, you just replace that particular block with a network. Okay, and I'll explain both methods and when you may want to use each one of them. So those of you interested, we have a recent review where we go through this in more detail. And in fact, we have two recent books, one focused on wireless communications and one actually focused on medical applications where we go into some of these ideas in more details in, in the context of those particular problems. So let's look at each one of these ideas in more detail, and then we'll go through various different applications. So the idea of unrolling actually dates back to a really beautiful paper of Gregor and McLuhan from over a decade ago, but I would say only in the past few years has really been revisited, uh, particularly by the signal processing and optimization community. So the idea is actually very simple, right? What we do in unfolding is we take our optimization problem we've seen before, and what we do is we first write down let's say 10 steps of the algorithm, okay? A small number of steps of the algorithm. Now we all know that if we take an iterative algorithm and apply it, let's say for 10 steps, typically we will not get a very good outcome, right? Usually you have to run iterative algorithms for thousands of iterations in order to get anything useful. But what we're gonna do here is we're gonna use 10 steps, okay? And I'm just saying 10 as example, but in most unfolding techniques, people don't use you know more than 20 or 30 steps. So the point is that you use a small number. So up until here, there's no learning. But then in the last step, what we do is in each one of these iterations, there's parameters that depend on the model. And of course, the whole idea of using learning is that we assume that we don't necessarily know the entire model. So what we're gonna do now is learn the parameters from data, okay? So we end up getting a network that resembles our optimization solver, and it will depend both on the loss, the regularizer, and the particular solver that we chose. Okay, so for the same loss and regularizer, we could use different solvers, and that will lead to different networks. 
Okay, so this is in principle what unfolding looks like, and this is a recent review that we wrote on unfolding, particularly in the context of imaging, but we'll see um, some examples throughout the talk. So hopefully this at least gives you a sense of uh, what we do in unfolding. The other technique that we look at is good for problems that don't actually follow from a very structured optimization formulation. So, and there's many, many examples in communication that we're going to look at uh, later on. So, for example, if we think of dynamic programming or the Viterbi solver, right, it's not really, I mean, it originates from a maximum likelihood function, but it's not really directly uh, minimizing some objective function. So there's many examples where we just have a good heuristic, right? Like, let's say the Viterbi algorithm, but it depends on things we don't know. Let's say the channel. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at which block depends on something we don't know. And we're just going to replace that block by a very simple network. Okay, so it's just a very simple plug-in approach, but where we can show that in many cases, it's actually very useful and much better than learning end-to-end. -end. So the advantage of these two methods is that, of course, they relate to the signal processing problem that we started off from, and it ends up giving us methods that are interpretable and much easier to analyze, and we'll talk more about that uh, as we go through the talk. So just to kind of give a high-level view of what we said until now, we're basically looking for a middle ground between, you know, these very abstract data-driven methods where we just throw everything we have at some network and these very principled model-based networks, which both are trying to do the same thing, right? Both are, both are trying to take an input and predict an output, but of course they're doing it in very different ways. And what we just said is that there's two general ways in which we can try and merge them. So we can look at things like the Viterbi detector or sparse recovery that are based on very principled model-based frameworks. And each one of those have equivalents that are just deep networks, right? So there's many, many papers, let's say, that look at imaging and replace the standard sparse recovery with some deep image recovery. There, there have been many, many uh, papers that looked at how you do symbol detection using deep networks, right? So these are more uh, generic deep network approaches applied to these problems. And what we're suggesting instead is to combine them, and we'll see each of these examples later on in the talk. So sparse recovery could be generalized to Lista, that's the unfolding method of Gregor and Lacoon, and the Viterbi detector, the plug-in approach I described before will lead to what we call the Viterbi net. And basically these are two different approaches where we do one of two things. Either we infer using a deep network, but the model-based methods give us the architecture of the network. So that's what we do in the unfolding method. Or we are using an algorithm like in the Viterbi net. So at the end, we're just using an algorithm, but the particular parts we don't know, we augment them with a neural network. Okay, so in both cases, we're capturing the signal processing structure in the problem, but embedding it in one way or another within these uh, deep networks. Okay, so that's kind of the overall idea. And what I'm gonna to try to do in the rest of the talk is give you some concrete applications, which hopefully uh, will make it a little bit more specific. And since it's a small crowd, I think it's fine. Feel free to kind of shoot questions as I'm going through. So uh, if anything, I hope that's okay. Yeah, so sure, go ahead. Yeah, in one of the layers. So in a sense, unfolding is doing that. So unfolding is basically changing the generic layers into layers that are principled and coming from the signal processing formulation. Okay, so hopefully when we look at particular examples, that will be a little bit more clear, but that is the spirit of, uh, of, of what we're doing here. Okay, so let's start kind of, we'll start with the unfolding techniques and go through them a little bit more slowly and then start looking at particular examples. So like I said before, the idea in unfolding is that we take some iterative algorithm, okay, that we're going to represent over here. So we have our input Y, it goes through some function, we get our current estimate X, and in a general iterative algorithm, you just apply this many, many times. So what we're going to do in unfolding is we apply this a finite number of times, okay, K times. But then each one of these layers, we're now going to think of them as parameterized by parameters, where in a standard iterative algorithm, those are fixed, right? The same layer is applied over and over again. In unfolding, we're going to think of these as parameters, and we're actually going to learn them from data. Okay, so that's how we're going to get different layers. So let's look, for example, at maybe, you know, one of the most uh, uh, popular examples that have been looked at in signal processing, at least in the last decade, which is the sparse recovery problem. So we assume that we have 
let's say a linear Gaussian model where we have a sparse input observed through some linear transform with Gaussian noise. And then, you know, one of the most popular methods to recover X is to use this um, least squares objective with an L1 sparsity. And if you just apply a simple proximal gradient algorithm uh, to solve this problem, you end up getting the very famous iterative shrinkage and thresholding ISTA algorithm, which basically what it does in each iteration, it computes the gradient. So this is coming from the gradient where mu is the step size. And then you have this thresholding opera operator, which is coming from the proximal projection. Okay, so this is just a regular proximal gradient apply to this objective. And if you apply this many times, typically like, you know, 10,000 times, you'll end up recovering a sparse input. Okay, so this is one of the most popular methods used for sparse recovery. Okay, so how would we turn this into a network? So now, instead of applying this fixed iteration, you know, 20,000 or 10,000 times, what we're going to do now is we're going to write this down a finite number of times, let's say 10 times. And now we could input different levels of learning, depending on what we know and what we don't know. So for example, if A is known entirely, if we know the forward model, then maybe we want to keep these fixed, just like they are over here, and only learn the lambda in each layer and the mu, the step size in each layer. So that's kind of the, you know, minimal amount of learning. On the other hand, if we don't know A exactly, or we're not even sure that our data is really perfectly linear, then we could learn A as well, or we could just call these blocks W1 and W2 and learn them independently. Okay, so there's a lot of flexibility here in terms of how do we apply this. We could apply different levels of learning, but in all cases, we're getting an architecture that starts from our original problem formulation. And it's clear here, that if there's anything we know about the problem, if we added another regularizer or change the metric, then we're going to get a different architecture. So the neural network that we get depends on the signal processing model and the signal processing metric that we started off with. Okay, so this is kind of a variation of the original idea of uh, Gregor and Lacoon, and it could be extended in many, many different ways. So one nice thing that you could do immediately is that once we have an optimization formulation of the problem, we could use, you know, the many tools that have been developed in optimization to develop interesting new networks. So, for example, one of the big issues that we all are aware of with networks is robustness, right? Like, you know, if the data changes a little bit or if the test data and the training data we're not the same, then we know that the networks are gonna perform quite poorly. So here it's very natural to say, okay, since we're using an optimization formulation, why don't we use robust optimization to get a robust network? And that's very simple to do in a sense, right? Because the optimization formulation is already there. So there's been many, many works trying to robustify networks. And in some sense, they're very heuristic, right? Like you take a network and then there's all these tricks that are done to try to robustify them, what we're going to do here instead is say, no, let's just use the optimization formulation of robustness. So for example, one thing we could do is use what's known as robust uh, lasso, where the idea is that we allow a perturbation to the forward model, and then we minimize both the error, the noise, but also the error in the forward model. Okay, so this is a well-known uh, robust optimization formulation, and you can show that if you try to solve this minimization problem, then it's the same as solving almost the original problem we had before, but we have this extra scaling over here of the least squares objective. Okay, and again, this is a heuristic. This follows from optimization. So now, instead of doing unfolding to the objective we had before, we could do unfolding to this new metric. Okay, so we end up getting a robust network, but we're not guessing it. It comes from the mathematical formulation. And not surprisingly, we can show that this new network that we get is in fact much more robust than standard networks. So if the test data and the original and the training data are, are not the same, then we get much better performance using this network. And the nice thing is that, of course, here it's hard to see the details, but if you look at the paper, the actual network that we get is not something you would have guessed, okay? It has all these normalizations that look quite complicated, but at the end, you know, we're not guessing them. They just follow from the optimization. So it's a very natural thing to do. And of course, now we could start having fun and start taking, you know, the various things we know from optimization and applying them uh, to deep networks. So, okay, I won't go into all the different variations, but I hopefully you get the point. And what I want to do now is show various different applications uh, where we've applied this in practice. So the first thing we looked at, and this is uh, work that we did with uh, Vishal Monga and, and his students, was saying, okay, could we use this very, very simple idea to get image deblurring? Now, there's probably, I don't know, 
tens of thousands of papers on doing image deblurring with various different uh, deep networks. So when we started off, our goal was not necessarily to be better than them, but to see if we could compete with them using something very, very simple that you could program, you know, without having to know a lot about deep networks. So what we did was something very uh, intuitive. We said, okay, let's start with an optimization problem. What's our optimization problem? We're going to look for features of the image that match features of the data, where we assume that the features are sparse. So we add an L1 regularizer on the features and an L2 regularizer on the unknown blurring kernel. Okay, so almost the simplest thing that you could think of doing, nothing too elaborate. And then this gives us the optimization formulation. And then we use variable splitting, which you could think of as ADMM for those who are more familiar with ADMM, uh, to kind of unroll this method. We used 10 unrolled iterations and applied it to a well-known data set. So what you see over here are examples of this network. And again, it's a really simple network. You don't have to use no deep networks in order to apply it. It's just, again, starting from the optimization formulation, 10 layers, we learned the parameters from data. And what you could see over here, hopefully you can see on the screen, uh, we, can, we, we trained it over an, an existing data set that's used as the benchmark. And what's really cool is that you can see that it actually competes very well and, and actually performs better than state-of-the-art method, even though it's a very, very simple network, both in terms of, you know, the metrics that people use, PSNR, ISNR, and SSIM, but also visually, you can see this is our method over here. You can see that you get much sharper features than competing deep networks, where the competing networks were trained over much larger data sets and, of course, had a lot of tweaking, okay? So they have many, many parameters and much more tweaking, whereas our network really is just following from an optimization formulation without any tweaking. Yeah. No, 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 the exact same, Every, the exact same. The, the training and everything was done in the exact same way. Okay, just our network has much fewer parameters. The blur was the same. Yeah, we took it all from the, the same data set. Um, okay, so in what we did before, the problem was relatively simple. I mean, you could see in the type of data that we had, right, there was, there was blur, but it was basically linear blur. Um, and therefore, we were able to treat it using kind of relatively simple regularizers. But what we wanted to look at next is what if we have much more complicated um, problems? Like, for example, you know, we just have a missing uh, area in an image. That's going to be hard to do with just a simple L1 or an L2. So here, what we thought of doing is to say, okay, let's still do the unfolding, but we'll also unfold the regularizer. So instead of assuming that the regularizer is fixed, like let's say L1 or L2, which is not powerful enough for more complicated problems, we could unfold the regularizer. So we can assume some parameterized form of the regularizer and just learn the parameters of the regularizer together with learning the forward model. So particularly here, we use what's known as normalizing flows. It's not so important. It's basically just a form of parameter parameterizing a PDF, and we did the unfolding also on the regularizer, not just on the forward problem. And this already allowed us to treat much more difficult problems. So here you see, for example, um, clean images, different forms of corruption. So here we have very heavy noise. Here we have just a cropped part of the image, and here we have very heavy blur. And we're comparing our method, which again is a very simple unfolding approach um, with much more sophisticated algorithms uh, that are in the literature, which of course have many more parameters or trained the larger data sets, et cetera. So again, we see that we get very, very good results. And again, at least for me, the nice thing is that it really just follows from the same principles that we've always used in signal processing, with the extra twist that we learn these parameters instead of keeping them fixed. But we still end up with something that's interpretable. And if we want to make changes to it, we still we know how to do it because we know where it's coming from. Okay, so the next thing I want to show is how we applied this to more complicated problems. And one of the things that we're very interested in in our group is medical imaging. And these are problems that are quite hard to model very specifically uh, with nice equations. So one, one practical problem that we've been dealing with for several years is uh, various different problems in ultrasound, where one of them is trying to separate blood flow from tissue. So when you do an ultrasound scan, uh, there's a particular mode of ultrasound called contrast-enhanced ultrasound, which could be very powerful. The problem is that you're using the contrast to see the blood flow, but then you get very strong reflections from the tissue. Okay, so this is actually after separation, but you see here that the tissue is very strong and what you're interested in is in the blood. So when they're on top of each other, it's very hard to see the blood flow. 
So there's been you know, many different approaches that people have used to try and separate them, SVD being the most popular, but it's just not powerful enough to do the separation. Here you see, for example, using SVD, it's still, you still don't see separated tissue and blood flow. So what we did here is trying to use this low ring plus sparse, which again is a very popular model that's been used in signal processing in the past decade. So the, the idea is to model the data as being composed of low ring plus sparse, but that wasn't powerful enough. So when we did that, we got this, it's better than this, but it's still not powerful enough. But then the next step was to unfold that. And again, the advantage when you do unfolding is that the, you don't really assume that the model is exact, right? You allow some flexibility. So just as a, a, a funny thing, we call this method Corona, which I don't know, actually in English, people don't use Corona so much, right? In Hebrew, COVID was called Corona. So anyways, it, this was before COVID, but uh, yeah, so we laughed and our method went viral. But anyway, we published this right before COVID. Um, but anyway, so again, the idea is just the same as before. We have a least squares objective. We have a low rank uh, norm on the low rank part and a sparsity prior on the sparse part. And then we unfold it. And uh, again, we unfolded a simple proximal gradient scheme. So I won't go through the details. These are just standard optimization details. But then we unfolded it and learned the parameters from data. And it actually worked really well. So this is true data where, you know, this is what we start off with. And this is the separation. Now, of course, here, there's no ground truth, right? All we can measure are the patients. I don't have ground truth, but you can look at the images and it really does look like it does a good job in doing the separation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we do. So we, we do, you, sorry. What if it's not, uh, you cannot find it? Yeah, okay, so really good point. Yeah, that's a very good point. So we do use uh, back propagation here when we do the actual learning. So what we do in practice is that if anything is not differentiable, we kind of smooth it. And actually, people have done this in sparse recovery anyway, for other reasons, because when it's not smooth, even the forward pass is not so easy. So we just use the same trick. Okay, we basically smooth the, the different um, regularizers, and that's powerful enough. The, the other important thing is that we never use more than 10 layers. I mean, I keep on saying 10, because really, that's what we use. And when you only use a small number of layers, all of the problems of like vanishing gradients and all of these issues that you typically have in deep networks, they don't appear because just 10 layers are not enough for them to happen. So it also just takes care of a lot of the nitty gritty details of deep learning that usually you know, become an issue. Here, because we have a small number of layers, it doesn't happen anyway. Yes, you can save a lot of training data. So on what order can you save? Sorry. Uh, you can yeah. Of so what? Yeah, that's a good point. So I'll show some theoretical results at the end. But in practice, we've been able to train, you know, with really like in this case over here. So here, there's no ground truth, right? So actually, this is important. I mean, it's not what you asked, but to answer what you asked, I have to say that. So you could have asked, how do we train here? Because we have no ground truth to begin with, right? So so that's actually interesting because what we assume the ground truth is is the output of the optimization algorithm. So I say, okay, I'm going to take it. I'm going to run twenty thousand steps of the optimization algorithm and treat that as my ground truth, right? Although the output is not so good. And first of all, the cool thing is that even though we use that as ground truth, it actually gives us a good result at the end. But here, let's say in terms of training data, we only use two patients. So each patient had 10 or 20 frames, but it's the same patient, right? So we only had two independent patients each one having 20 frames. So really it's nothing, right? I mean, very, very small amounts of data and still we get very good results. Yeah, so it, it's, it's kind of cool. Um, okay, we can use this also for other things like subsampling. So I won't go into too much detail here. This, of course, relates to prior work that we've done in subnanical sampling. But now, again, we could just make everything more powerful because we don't have to have um, such exact models. So besides just using it for separation, we've also used this to do very efficient sampling so that now instead of having the big ultrasound machine, we can actually do the sampling in the probe itself and send the data uh, wirelessly to some remote machine. And oh. Okay, well, this has sound that you can't hear, but um, anyways, that's Dr. Shaitai Manuel Den. If you could hear him, you would hear him say all this medical stuff. Like he's scanning uh, my student here now with this digital probe. So basically using this unfolding, we could get very fast recovery using small amounts of data. And what we're doing here is that the data is going directly from the probe to the local machine, to a remote machine, you'll see it in a second via the cloud, and to an iPad. So at the end, we don't need an ultrasound machine, we only need a probe thanks to these unfolding techniques. Now, the other nice thing is that once we have access to the data itself, so today on ultrasound machines, you don't have access to data, you only get the final image. 
now that we know how to sample efficiently, we get access to the data. And once we have the data, we could do two interesting things. So one is we can say, okay, instead of using standard beamforming that everybody uses for ultrasound, for radar, or whatever, we could take that raw data, what we call channel data, and apply model-based beamforming to it. So we do the same thing, the same idea of unfolding, but to actually do the beamforming, and that gives us much clearer images, okay? So this is the same data, but this is after we did model-based beamforming. So that's kind of one thing you could do. The other thing you could do, and, and this is a clinical study that we did where we, we did this on clinical data. So this was patients with um, breast cancer, and uh, again, I won't go through the details here, but we, we worked with doctors here to see if it actually gives them clinically a better image, right? Because just because our metrics say it's better doesn't mean that clinically it's better. But actually, the doctors were, were very happy with the new images and thought that they were clinically uh, more informative. The, the other thing we could do is that once we have the channel data, we can actually look for quantitative parameters. So today, if you think of ultrasound and some aspects of radar, they're very qualitative and not quantitative. We just get an image, but we don't know anything about the actual physical parameters. Now that we have access to the data, we can use the unfolding again to solve the wave equations. Now, people, of course, have thought before of solving wave equations to extract physical parameters. The problem is that the wave equations are super complicated. And therefore, first of all, you get very complicated equations that you can't solve in real time, and therefore it's not interesting. The other thing is that the wave equations are approximate, right? You approximate them as linear functions, et cetera, and they're not exact. So now what we could do is again apply unfolding on the raw data to solve these wave equations. And this is an example over here where you see it's the same data. So this is beam forming on the data. And this is solving the wave equations using this unfolding to get the quantitative parameters. And here specifically, we're looking at a speed of sound map. So you can see here, if you look at this image, you see several black regions, which you know could be suspect of having a lesion and having some sort of tumor, but it's very hard to identify where exactly it is and if it is or is not a tumor. And these are cases where you would send the patient to a biopsy because it's just too hard to know. But on the other hand, if you look at the speed of sound map, then you see right away that the tissue in this area is different. And in fact, this is a patient with breast cancer where the lesion is in fact over here. So it's a really nice example. Well, not, not nice in terms of the patient having cancer, but given that that's the fact anyway, it's really nice in showing that by getting the quantitative parameters, you can get really informative, much better information than by just looking at an image. So basically we could use unfolding in different ways. We can use it to do, be more efficient in the data acquisition. We can use it to solve different kinds of equations and not just getting images. Okay, so switching gears, we've used it for many other applications as well. I won't go through uh, uh, more and more examples, but let me just say we've used it, for example, in COVID-19 uh, for detection from x-ray and from ultrasound to detect COVID. And here, when COVID started, we worked with several hospitals in Israel. Uh, again, I'm sure every country had their challenges in Israel. Uh, one of the big challenges, at least at least at the beginning, the first year, uh, was really just the detection rate. So PCR took an awful long time, like three days to detect the PCR. And for those of you who know Israelis, Israelis are very impatient. So nobody would wait for their result. And then, you know, people were sick and they would contaminate others. So they were they were desperately looking for a method that would give faster results. And we worked with several hospitals on detecting COVID from x-ray. And just to show you that it's not an easy task. So if you look at these uh, x-rays, right? So some of them, like this looks pretty clear. Um, this one looks pretty clear, but if you look at the results, actually, this is positive to COVID-19, even though it looks really clear, uh, right? Whereas this is negative, although it looks pretty blurry. So it's not so easy to tell from x-ray itself, but using this uh, model-based framework, we were able to get really good results, over 90% detection, and this was actually implemented in one of the biggest hospitals in Israel. So again, we, we're not replacing doctors, okay? We use this together with the radiologists. But once they got the output of the algorithm, you know, they, they re-looked the image and very often uh, changed their decision. So this is from x-ray. We did the same thing uh, from ultrasound. I'll skip through that. Um, okay, so these were all kind of imaging examples. Another nice thing that we've looked at using unfolding from is super resolution. So there's been a lot of work in the community and, and by many people sitting here on super resolution in, in many different applications, right, using L1. And here what we wanted to do is to say, okay, could we do unfolding 
um, to go beyond what we could do today. So we looked at this particularly uh, both in microscopy and in ultrasound. And let me start with microscopy just to change gears a little bit uh, since we've looked at ultrasound until now. So one of the basic problems in microscopy, which motivated a lot of work and also, you know, one of the famous results by Candice, um, is, is the fact that we're limited by the diffraction limit. So we can see details that are smaller than half the wavelength used for illumination, which means that if we're using an optical microscope, we can see cells and bacteria, but we won't be able to see proteins and small molecules. And this is just a limit of physics, right? It's not a limit of the particular microscope um, that we're using. In 2014, the Nobel Prize went to this really clever idea of super resolution using fluorescence microscopy. And the idea was to in insert these fluorophores and then control their blinking so that now instead of taking a single high resolution image, which you can't do by the laws of physics, you can take thousands of exposures where in each one, there's only a small number of fluorophores that are blinking. Okay, so think of an image that really should have, you know, many, many green points, but then you can't see them, they overlap. So instead you control the chemistry, and that's why the Nobel Prize was in chemistry, so you control the chemistry so that in each exposure, you only have, let's say, three blinking spots. And then, you know, if it's sparse enough, they won't overlap. And then you can pinpoint them in each image and sum over all images. So this is a very clever method. It's used a lot um, and, in fact, won the Nobel Prize. Um, but what you're basically doing here is you're changing spatial resolution for temporal resolution. Because now to get a single image, you have to have thousands of exposures. And you can no longer do, for example, live cell imaging. Okay, so you have to kill the cell in order to image it. So what we wanted to look at is whether we can use these unfolding methods together with sparse recovery to be able to do super resolution with only a small number of exposures. So in the interest of time, I'll skip through the technical details. Again, it's basically sparse recovery techniques that we do um, unfolding. But the nice thing is that it really works well. So what we're showing here, this is simulation and this is real data. Um, this is a diffraction limited, what you would see from a standard microscope. Since this is simulation, we have ground truth. This is what you get from the method behind the Nobel Prize using 12,000 frames. And this is what we get using our method using only 300 frames. Okay, so we can we can reduce two orders of magnitude and get even better results. It works really well on real data as well. Um, and when we do the unfolding, we don't have to know any parameters of the microscope in advance. Okay, so this is very robust. We can use this in any microscope. We don't have to estimate the point spread function. So we get very high resolution, both in time and in space, without having to know anything about the underlying microscope. And now we've been collaborating with um, Professor Guillaume Duran, who's a professor of chemistry, at Weizmann, and he's been interested in, in T cell activation, which is a very important part of uh, cancer cells. But until now, they haven't been able to see them, the dynamics of T cells in real time. So using these techniques for the first time, we've been able to actually see the T cell activation. And what's nice, I guess for him, but also for us, is that he had a series of papers on like a hypothesis of what happens um, to the T cell during the dynamics, but of course they were never able to see it, so it was only our hypothesis. And then he gave us the films and we did the super resolution, and lucky for both of us, it actually coincided with the papers that he wrote and when he expected to happen. So that was kind of cool. And again, those of you interested, we've been doing quite a bit of work on this with the Broad Institute on using these deep uh, unrolled recovery methods for biological imaging. And the really nice thing again is that everything is interpretable, so you could correlate, correlate the results nicely with a different hypothesis that but the biologist or the chemist had about the actual process. Um, okay, the last application I want to show here is to super resolution and ultrasound. So I mentioned before that one way to get better resolution is to use contrast agents. And many people are familiar with that from, let's say, MRI and CT. You could do something similar in ultrasound where you inject these gas microbubbles into the bloodstream. But the point is that these gas microbubbles have better contrast, so they reflect the signal better. Therefore, presumably, you could get a better image. The problem is that that doesn't actually work. So what happens is you get a brighter image. Okay, so this is actually a breast lesion. So this is a study we did on breast cancer patients. This is a breast lesion. If you use contrast agents and don't do any particular processing, then what you get is just a very bright image. Okay, so it's true that you get better contrast, but better contrast doesn't actually help you in terms of tumor detection. But then what we did is, again, we applied these unfolding sparse recovery techniques in the, in the relevant domain. And now what's really cool is that you could actually see what you couldn't see before. So these are three patients with uh, breast lesions. And here, this is a standard ultrasound with contrast, okay? But you see that 
you just see these black holes. You can't see within the black holes. So it actually didn't help you get better resolution. But then after we use these unfolding methods, we can actually fill in the details. And you see that these are three very different lesions. So here you see that it's very homogeneous. And that actually means that it's a benign tumor. Here you see that there's fluids inside, which means that it's not even a tumor. It's just a cyst. And here, unfortunately, this is actually a malignant tumor because you can see that it's very non-homogeneous and it's very, the edges are very rough and that's indicative of a, a malignant tumor. So using these sparse recovery methods in an unfolded fashion, we were able to really get super resolution that you couldn't get before. Okay, so to kind of uh, wrap up, because I think I'm going over time. So in total, we spoke about unfolding. The other method we mentioned for techniques that are not really based on optimization methods is using this plug-in approach, and that was particularly used in communication. So the reason is that a lot of the popular methods in communication are not actually optimization algorithms. So in, in super processing, in, in energy, a lot of the methods are based on very kind of principled optimization, whereas in communication, a lot of them are kind of heuristics, right? Like the Vitruvi algorithm is dynamic programming, uh, successive interference cancellation is a greedy method, right? So we wanted to see how we could apply these model-based methods to those kind of techniques as well. And here we use the more plug-in approach. So let's look, for example, at the Vitruvi algorithm. Everyone here is familiar with it, so I don't have to introduce it. Um, you know, many, many papers that looked at doing simple detection using deep networks, where, of course, the idea is to just replace, uh, you know, the Viterbi algorithm with an end-to-end -end learning technique. And what we suggested to do instead is to go back to the Viterbi algorithm. If you look at it carefully, what you find is that you could think of it in two steps. There's a step that computes the likelihood in each iteration. And then there's the dynamic programming, right, the trellis, which actually does not depend on anything. It only depends on the output of the likelihood. Okay, so if, for example, you don't know the channel, there's no reason to replace this whole part, the dynamic programming approach with the network. It's still perfectly valid. The only thing that we won't know how to compute is the likelihood. So what we do is instead of it replacing everything with a deep network, we just use a network to compute the likelihood. And that's actually a very simple classification problem. So we could do that with a one or two layer network. But then the output is still plugged into the trellis algorithm. And this is what leads to what we call the Viterbi net. So this was work that we did together with Andrea Goldsmith. And the cool thing about this is that obviously it's still interpretable. It's very simple. And in fact, we showed that we can use this without having to add any extra symbols for training. So the standard precoder that you would have, uh, preamble that you would have anywhere on the communication network is enough to do the training here. And training is done on the fly. And what's nice is that we get the same, almost the same performance as you get from the Viterbi algorithm as if you need the channel, even though we don't know the channel. So it trains very rapidly and adapts very rapidly to the different channel conditions. So we could do this for many other methods in communication as well. So for example, we've looked at factor graph methods, which are very popular in communication. And then again, instead of replacing them with an end-to-end -end deep network, we only learned the factors themselves and then still kept the message passing algorithm because that doesn't depend on the channel. So we do message passage, message passing over a graph where we only learn the factors in the graph. Uh, we could do the same thing for interference cancellation. So again, we keep the greedy approach of interference cancellation, but we learn the likelihood of each individual symbol in order to guess who is the strongest. That is the only thing we learn from data, but we keep the overall structure of successive interference cancellation. And many, many more examples. Okay, so those of you interested, you could look at our book on this where we go into more detail. But the point is that we keep the underlying communication algorithm. We only learn what we need within the algorithm. Uh, we've done this for Kalman filtering as well, which leads to what we call the Kalman net. So maybe let me let me skip that. Um, and I just, I do want to end with a little bit of theory. So just one last example I'm going to show because we're excited about it. And actually we're going to have a demo of this. Those of you who are interested, we'll have a live demo on Wednesday in the demo session. So we've used these ideas also for vital sign monitoring of patients going back to radar. And the idea to use sparse recovery methods, but in this unfolded uh, technique. And using that, we could use a very simple radar to measure vital signs of multiple patients. Uh, well, not multiple people. They don't have to be patients. They don't have to be sick. Uh, multiple people in a room. So we just stick a radar on the ceiling, and we can measure uh, vital signs of multiple people. And again, we're going to have a live demo of this on Wednesday. So uh, you're welcome to come and look at it. And we've been extending these. So these are partial results. So here, this is still very much work in progress. But we've been looking at whether we can 
use these types of ideas to try and, and uh, go through the skull and be able to get very good maps of, uh, of the brain. So this is, of course, much more difficult. So as you see, the results are not yet uh, convincing, but it's work in progress. Uh, we do have this nice skull. So it's not a real skull, by the way. <laughs> it's a phantom. Um, but even the phantom costs like $30,000. I don't know if that's more or less expensive than a real skull. But anyways, uh, but we have it in the lab and we're kind of playing around with these ideas. Uh, we've also been using this. So so this is this is a cow's brain. Okay, that that is cheap that you could actually buy. Uh, we've been using the same ideas for drug delivery systems. So drug delivery today is, is typically done by gold nanoparticles. And we can use these same ideas to detect the nanoparticles um, within the tissue. So it's easier to show it on cow tissue than on human tissue. So we're starting with cow tissue, but hopefully eventually we'll be able to do this on humans as well. So just to wrap up with a little bit of theory and, and uh, to, to, to substantiate some of the results that I've shown. So we kept, we kept on saying we get interpretable results, we could train with a small amount of data, uh, you know, we get good performance, et cetera, et cetera. We've seen that in many examples, but the question is, you know, could we prove that? So of course, proving anything in deep networks is complicated, but actually the cool thing is that this is easier to prove than general deep networks, and that's because there's a lot of structure. So it makes the proofs easier as well. So in some recent results, together with uh, my students and Miguel Rodriguez, we were able to show, for example, that using this model-based network, you actually do get a generalization error that's smaller than if you did not use a model-based network. And what's actually cool is that we can show that the generalization error decays as the num with the number of layers. Now, that is super intuitive, right? We know that if we add more layers, the generalization error decays. But most of the results, actually all the results that we're aware of, um, besides ours in the literature, don't capture that. So if you look at standard results in learning theory, the generalization error actually grows with the number of layers. So this is the first result that shows that it decays using this uh, model-based network. And we also could get bounds on the number of training samples that we need. So this goes back to your question. Again, these are, of course, bounds, so they don't capture the finite sample effect. But in terms of bounds, we can show that we need orders of magnitude less data than non-model-based non networks. Okay, so to wrap up, we tried to show how we could kind of bridge uh, learning theory with signal processing. Hopefully, I've convinced you all that signal processing has a huge role, at least in my opinion, to, pl to play in these types of problems. I think it's, it's very important we can get methods that are nice, that are interpretable, that we control, and we get the best of both worlds. We could do both signal processing and learning. Uh, there's much more to be done, of course, on the theory side. So if anyone is interested, we're, we're definitely looking for collaborators on that. Uh, those of you interested, we have a recent review that was just published, so you could go ahead and look at some of the details. And there's many details on my webpage. Of course, none of this would have been done without my amazing uh, team of students and collaborators that I've had the pleasure to work with. And thank you very much for your attention. So if there's time, happy to take questions. <laughs> Here. Well, the data that you're using, you said you're only using two patients, right? Did you try it with more? And do you know how is this going to behave with more patient, more data, as it's going to be more complex? And you might need to have like a bigger network as well. So how, how this can fit? Yeah, and that's a really good question. So in that particular case, uh, we, we really only had two patients um, to work with. But then later on, we got more patients. So we, we tested it on other patients and showed that the same network uh, worked well. We did do, I think that's what you suggested. So correct me if I misunderstood you, but I think what you suggested is to say, okay, let's say as we get more patients, could we retrain and see if we do better? So in that particular case, we actually did that. We only ended up having like 10 patients. So it's not like we had a huge amount, but when we retrained, we did not do better. And actually at some point we were doing worse. Okay. So it was like training on a small amount of patients was actually good. And it intuitively makes sense because there's not a lot of parameters, right? I mean, basically the model captures most of it and there's only a small number of parameters to play around with. So of course, like anything in learning, right? At the end, there is always some trial and error. It's not a fixed theory, right? There's always something to play around with. But from our experience, actually training on small data sets um, is, is better than training on large data sets. In, in this case, when you're using a very parameterized function. 
Wonderful talk, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, um, and you talk about uh, the distribution shift, which is a, a major issue that being talked in the machine learning community and the formulation that you incorporate those uh, kind of proactively to um, be able to cope with some of the shift. Are there kind of a limit um, in terms of how much shift you will be able to tolerate? And uh, a related question is, um, would there be a graceful degradation when there's a such shift? So is there a limit that we see a clip or uh, is there graceful degradation and how much we can tolerate? Yeah, really, really good question. Thank you. So I think the nice thing is that the answers to all of these questions are very similar to the answers you would get from optimization. So if you think of, let's, let's put learning aside for a minute. If you think of robust optimization, you could ask the same question, right? Like if I have a problem and I try to make it robust and you know, there's different formulations of doing that, you could do minimax, you can add an error, but all of those will have the problem that if I make the uncertainty set too large, then you know the algorithm is just not going to be good on average, right? It's only going to be good for like the worst case. But if I make it too small, then it's not going to be robust, right? So in a sense, it's it's very similar to that. The the advantage in some sense that we have is that when you're using standard robust optimization, you make a choice and you're kind of stuck with it, right? Here we make a soft choice in the sense because it's a parameter that we actually learn from the data. So it will be affected by the type of data we train on. Okay. If I train on something that's very diverse, then I'll have a method that's more robust, but you know, for the nominal case, it won't be as good. So in, in some sense, it's the same trade-offs you would get from robust optimization, but a little bit less harsh because we are learning from the data. Okay. But it is still, of course, sensitive to what you learn from. So I think. I mean, this all raises, you know, there's there's many, many open points here. I think in some sense, it's like there's some bi-level optimization going on here, right? Because I have, for any kind of class of uncertainty, then the unfolding will work quite well, but I don't necessarily know in advance how uncertain I am, right? So I'd want like, you know, something on top of that, which a little bit relates to meta-learning and hyperparameters and stuff like that. So we have been looking at that. It's, it's, it's more tricky, of course, but I think that's really the next step, right? Of doing like, an unfolded by level kind of optimization. Hi. Uh, so you said something about, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. You said something about uh, more training data causing, resulting in worse results in, uh, in answering the previous questions. Why would that happen? Uh, yeah, just, okay. Uh, I mean, not that, like that should not be the conclusion of this talk. Yeah. So, <laughs> that is like a particular comment or a particular question. So don't, don't misquote me out of this room. But uh, yeah, no, no. So yeah, well, that, that needs to do with all the overfitting, right, that you would get. So think about it again. I, I, at least for me, it's always helpful to think of like standard optimization, right? If I have a small number of parameters, then I don't need, like think of optimization before learning, right? Like very often we would have signal processing problems where we'd have, you know, let's say we don't know how to choose the regularization parameter. And then we would say, okay, let's look at a few examples and we'll use that to determine the regularization parameter. Now, if I look at, if I only have one parameter and I look at many examples, then chances are I'm, I'm going to be off, right? Because I'm, I'm overfitting in a sense. Like if I only have a small number of examples that are roughly characterizing what I need, then I'll get a good choice of lambda. If I try too many options, then, you know, my lambda is going to go all over the place and I'll probably not get such a good choice. So that, that was just a particular comment because the number of samples was very small. Of course, if I have you know, influent in many samples, then I'm not going to lose by having many, many, many samples. The, the point I think is that the types of problems we're looking at are problems where you don't have influent new samples, many samples to begin with. Because if you do, right, if I have infinite data like Google or Facebook, then I could use, you know, your full blown, I don't know, transformer or whatever, and it will probably work fine, right? As long as I don't change any of the channel conditions. So to begin with, the types of problems we're looking at are either problems where the training data is not very large or the, the reverse side of that, which is mathematically the same, that the conditions change, like SNR or whatever. So under the scenarios where conditions are going to be changing or you don't have a lot of training data, in that case, overfitting the training data is not necessarily going to be better than training on a small sample set. But that should be a... Again, exactly. not as a mathematical statement. It's a uh, particular answer to the ultrasound problem. But... Sure, sure. But that should be a function of the algorithm, right? So to prevent overfitting, if you have you know, generalization terms, or if you have prior, you know, terms, you know, 
Yeah, but I but don't. It does depend on the prior and the post uh, and the right the data. Right. The data. We're going back to the case, like when you say things like like prior, posterior. This implicitly assumes that I have large training sets for which I learned from which I learned to learn a PDF. I can't use two samples. Okay, so we're talking about really small numbers. No, no, I I don't mean Bayesian learning. I just mean the same effect. You know, in any model, you'll have something that depends on the new data that you're using and something that depends on the training data. So. Right, but the training data is not necessarily uniform. That's the point. So you're implicitly assuming that the training data is coming from the same distribution and then you would be correct. So that's, if the distribution is not varying, then that would be true. Then more samples are not gonna harm me. But the point is that in these types of problems like ultrasound, right, different yeah. patients are not IID. Of okay. Course. Okay. So, sure. but but that that's the essence of it. So, but I think that should help the generalization, right? But again, that goes back to big numbers. So, not in small numbers. Okay. When you have okay. small numbers, and it's a function at the end of you know the number of parameters that you're looking for, how sophisticated your model is, etc. But the the play here is in very small numbers. It's not the standard setting of learning where things are converging asymptotically, and you're also not assuming IID. Okay. So again, this was an answer particularly for the ultrasound case. No, I do want to emphasize it's a very important thing what you're saying. So of course, if my data is IID and I have large dating sets, then obviously more data is always going to help me. But, but here, that particular example that, that you were referring to was an ultrasound example where every patient, in a sense, is a different model. Now, I can't model individuals, right? Like, that's just not going to work. So we're trying to capture structure rather than capture PDF, right? So if you look at what we did there, we looked at, like, robust PCA, which, anyways, you like. So, <laughs> so that's into this, right? But it's not, it's not trying to capture something Bayesian because I wouldn't be able to do that from a small number of patients. I'm trying to capture structure, but I'm trying to capture, um, I would say, very dominant features in the structure. Like if I try to get fine structure, then I'm going to be off. Okay, because the fine structure is going to be different from patient to patient. So it's like I'm trying to get only global features that are robust enough across patients. Does that kind of make sense? We can talk off. Okay, yeah, sure. So what's the big benefits of uh, using uh, signal processing plus machine learning instead of just using like one very robust machine learning, even though, because, I mean, I say that as machine learning, okay, is not always like interpretable, but in some case, we don't, it's not that we don't care about the interpretability of it, but it, the output of the network's not gonna change any any life or anything. Like there's there's no impact on it. So why do we need that? <laughs> so so first of all, you said like there's no impact. We don't care. So we're looking at problems where we do care, right? Like definitely medical imaging. Obviously, I care about the outcome, right? I think anybody going to a doctor wants to know why they made a particular decision, right? Um, if we're thinking about radar, whether it's for you know imaging, radar imaging, or autonomous vehicles, or again, these are examples where you do very much care about the impact, right? It's not like okay, if I mistake the dog for a cat, so nothing bad is going to happen. But if I'm you know an autonomous vehicle and I made a wrong turn, then something bad will happen. So, I think all of the examples we've been looking at are examples where, first of all, you do very much care about the outcome. I think that's kind of point number one. Point number two, they're all examples, and this goes back to the previous question, where we don't, we won't typically have large training sets, or we won't have large IID training sets, okay? So these are more examples, kind of, I would say, real-life examples, where things can vary very rapidly. Like, if it's a communication problem, you know, channels change all the time. If it's radar, the same thing. If it's medical imaging, you know, patients are very different from each other. And actually, you care about the outliners. You don't care about the standard case that doctors, you know, don't need machine learning for. So the types of problems we're looking at here, which I think are very representative of a lot of things people do in signal processing, is that you actually don't have a lot of training data. Again, IND training data. You want to be able to adapt to varying conditions, and you do very much care about the outcome. So those are the cases where I believe the models are actually very useful, and I think that's that's kind of where signal processing right plays a role to begin with. So th the answer is kind of in the question, right? So just to summarize, I think, again, if you have massive amounts of training data, you don't care about interpretability, and you know, no big deal if you made a mistake, then you don't need model-based learning, right? I mean, standard learning, of course, works, right? We all know that. 
So what we're aiming at here are, are, are exactly the cases where things vary. You care about computational costs, right? You have to do things rapidly if you want to do them on the edge, for example. You care about the output. You want it to be interpretable. The output has an impact. Um, and you don't have a lot of training data. So those are the scenarios where the model, and again, I think those are the scenarios where modeling and signal processing help traditionally, right? So I think, I mean, I guess the way I view it is that, you know, and, and again, sorry for kind of going off on, but when I started my career, I remember those were the days where kind of convex optimization for communication was like very, very hot, right? And and I remember still like going to, I, as a student, I went to a, a tutorial of Tom Liu where he talked about, you know, convex optimization for communication. And I remember people saying, oh, now there's not going to be anything to do in communication because you could just use a convex optimization solver and solve any problem, right? And of course, we know that's not true. It's another super important tool that we all have many papers on, you know, how you use it. So in some sense, I view it the same way. I mean, learning is a super important tool and obviously we want to embrace it. But at least to me, it's it's another tool in this big paradigm of, you know, signal processing thinking. And just like optimization came along, I mean, it was always there, but at some point people started to embrace it within the community. And then it became an enabler for many things we couldn't do before. Now we have learning. But again, at least for me, we want to put it in the same framework, right? It's not instead of signal processing, it's together with. It's another tool that if we use, at least in my opinion, if we use appropriately within the framework of signal processing, we could do everything we did before, right? Just just better. We have another tool that we can use. Yeah, yeah. So heat maps, okay. I mean, heat, heat maps are interpretable in retrospect in the sense that they don't use an interpretable architecture. They don't a priori incorporate anything you know about the problem. You could use them only in retrospect, right? Like once you have a network, you could go back. And we did, we did, if you look at our paper that's saying COVID, we do compare there to heat maps, right? So you could go back and say, given the method, I could I could plot a heat map and see if it was doing what I expected it to do. So yeah, we do do things like that. But heat maps are are posteriori methods to analyze your network. They don't help you design a better network. All right. I'm happy to take more questions if anybody wants offline. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Eldar, for this wonderful presentation and very inspiring. Uh, so moving forward, we have our last session for today. Uh